When it comes to choosing the perfect GPU for your gaming PC build, it can be tricky to know what to pick. With AMD, Nvidia, and more recently, Intel to choose from, and a wide range of models that seem to be constantly changing in price, the best GPU to buy a month or two ago might not make the most sense right now. Which is why today I'll be running you guys through my favourites for all of the key price points. Listing off what the differences actually are between AMD and Nvidia GPUs, and pointing out models you should both consider and models you should avoid. Let's do this. The Corsair Titan series is here. Corsair's latest lineup of 240mm, 280mm, and 360mm of coolers feature Corsair's new flow drive cooling engine with a three phase pump for higher flow rates, higher efficiency, and better cooling. Cap swap compatibility allows you to change the top plate of your cooler, while IQ Link support and magnetic dome. RX fans round off a design that's ready to keep your CPU cool under pressure. Check out the range at the first link below. I'm going to start off with some very, very quick context into the GPU market right now before working through all of my recommendations. And as usual, feel free to use the timestamps on your screen to skip through the video as you wish. Now, fundamentally, there are three brands to choose from. Nvidia is the largest with nearly 90% market share, which is pretty nuts when you think about it, followed by AMD, who are easily the next best option. And then Intel, whose Arc GPUs are a welcome addition to the market, but just plainly not really good enough right now to win my recommendation in a guide like this. I'm hoping next-gen Intel Arc will be better. The first time around is always lots of learning for these brands, so I've got my fingers crossed. Now, NVIDIA and AMD use their own unique naming schemes. NVIDIA GPUs start with RTX, whereas AMD GPUs start with RX. NVIDIA GPUs start right from the 60-tier graphics card and work through to the 90-tier, while AMD GPUs start from the 600 tier and work through to the 900 tier. If you see the letters TI, Super, XT or XTX at the end of the graphics card, it basically just means it's a better version of the non-TI or non-Super derivative. Now, rather confusingly, not every card that has XT or XTX at the end has a non-XT version, but if you're wondering about how roughly all the GPUs rank against one another, you can find our GPU tier list linked in the cards now and at the links in the description below. As to whether you you should go for an AMD or Nvidia GPU in your build, it depends on lots of factors, primarily how much you want to spend. And my recommendations today will change between AMD and Nvidia for different price points. There are some clear advantages of each. AMD typically tends to be a lower price for the same rasterization performance. Rasterization is just like pure gaming performance. AMD also tend to give you more video memory at that price point, something which can be particularly useful for those of you looking to try and future-proof your build a little bit. Whereas in Nvidia GPUs have a better studio suite of features, great for video editing, streaming and rendering. They also tend to have better DLSS type support. That's basically an AI upscaler that renders the game out at a low res, uses AI to upscale and delivers more frame rate. That's better than AMD's equivalent, which is FSR, although that technology is catching up. More on that later. Finally, Nvidia GPUs are the better option if you want to enjoy ray traced gameplay. Ray tracing is a piece of tech that massively improves the visuals of certain titles, particularly those games that are heavy when it comes to lighting, particles, shadows, explosions. Not all games support ray tracing and the performance overhead even on Nvidia cards can still be fairly hefty. Now then, that's all the important context out of the way. What are my recommendations? Now, if you're looking to spend less than $200, we're going to start on this end of the table with the AMD RX 6600. Now, this is a great card for those of you looking at entry-level 1080p gaming without spending a fortune. You get 8 gigs of video memory, which is perfectly sufficient for 1080p, though we'll struggle at 1440p. And while you do get support for technology like AMD's own ray tracing and FSR support, this isn't a card you're going to be leveraging that tech on. Put simply, this is a card designed for entry-level gaming in AAA titles with better visual fidelity and frame rates possible in more of those esports games. Talking CSGO, Fortnite, Apex, Valorant, the 6600 is at home here. Other options at this price bracket include Intel's lower-end ARC A750 and potentially something like a second-hand NVIDIA RT x 3060. But this video is going to focus primarily on new GPUs and not the used market. This is an area though where you will see bigger upsides on the used market than the new, as obviously the less money you've got to spend, the more useful a deal can be. Now if you've got more than $200 but you'd like to spend less than $300, this is a really, really tricky area of the market. And here my recommendation is going to be controversial. Now this, and please hear me out here, is the RTX 4060. And I know what you're thinking, the 4060? Did didn't you call this one of the worst GPUs NVIDIA has ever made? Yes, I did. Now, as far as your options are concerned,
concerned, the RTX 3060 from last gen is one. Similarly, the RTX 4060 is another, while AMD's RX 7600 would be the third I would recommend. These are going to come in at around the $250 to $280 price point respectively. So why then does the 4060 earn my recommendation? Plainly, it provides very similar performance to the RX 7600, and while that card from AMD is a little cheaper, it only has 8 gigs of VRAM like the 4060, and lacks any really good FSR or ray tracing support. To be clear, it's more the FSR and DLSS AI upscalers you'll be using on the 4060, but for me, that was the deal breaker. Now you might think, well, why not recommend the 3060 then? Basically, this card's predecessor with four gigs more VRAM. And the reason for that is that the 3060 might not have the VRAM issues that the 4060 has, but it actually doesn't have enough power to typically leverage that VRAM anyway. The big VRAM debate of 2024 has been about cards like this that only include eight gigabytes, something that's perfectly sufficient for 1080p, but causes problems when you venture up to the 1440p resolution. And while I agree that the vast majority of the cards on the market right now should include at least 10, preferably 12 gigs of video memory to ensure gaming now and into the future, I just don't think that the 60 tier cards necessarily have enough power to satisfy that VRAM bus. Now, if you are looking to game at 1440p, lower settings in a select few titles, the 3060 is the better buy given the extra VRAM, but it comes at the expense of less overall frame rate and less raw power, something which to me leaves the 4060 as my primary recommendation. Let me make no bones about it. Buying a GPU right now for between $200 and $300 is pretty <laughs> And regardless of how we dress it up, the 4060 is still nowhere near my favorite GPU. In fact, recommending it today slightly pains me, but it's the best option, so that's where we land. Now, moving up the price brackets, if you want to spend less than $400, and this is where things do get better. And in particular, I'm talking about the RX 7700 XT. Now, this is one of those cards that I referenced in the intro where it has an XT at the end, but there's no non-XT variant. And this is AMD's lowest end 7000 series GPU that I can comfortably recommend. Recommend. Now, this is actually, in my opinion, one of the best value GPUs we've seen in a long time, easily in the last three or four years. This is a card that sits really well for 1440p gaming, and not only has the 12 gigs of VRAM needed from a memory standpoint, but the performance prowess to match at this higher resolution too. What's more, the price point when it first launched at 449 was a little high, but you can now find this card as low as 380 or 390 US dollars. Latest pricing and availability for all cards will, as always, be linked in the description below. Now, when the 7700 XT first launched, people said you should buy the 7800 XT instead. And that brings me nicely on to my GPU recommendations under $500. Now, this can commonly be found for the low 400s, depending on the cooler. This nice power color design is a little more, thanks to its RGB implementation and sleek backplate. However, the 7800 XT remains a very good value GPU. Its distance from the 7700 XT in terms of pricing has increased, making them both now better standalone options. But if you're in the low 400s, this is a great card. It gives you 7 or 8% more performance than the 7700 XT, which is, I find, just enough to tip you from the entry-level 1440p to the comfortable 1440p gaming bracket. And undoubtedly, this has better longevity for gaming in the future, not just now. The 7700 XT is a great card for 1440p in the present, but the 7800 XT undoubtedly has better legs for the long term. Oh, and 4 gigabytes more video memory, taking it up to a sweet 16 gigs. Stepping up another $100, and what if you want to spend between $500 and $600? Now, this is where you've got a lot of choice. Particularly in this lineup, you've got one, two, three cards to choose from. Now, the first of these is the RTX 4070 non-super, and this is, in my opinion, the lowest end NVIDIA GPU that I think is really worthwhile. The 4060 Ti is notably missing from this lineup based on its pretty terrible value for money proposition on base basically every count. Now the 4070 is not the best price to performance card at this bracket when you look at rasterization. And as a reminder, that's games where we've got no DLSS, no FSR, no ray tracing. However, if you want an Nvidia card, and that's just the position some people have, and that's fine, this is your entry level option, in my opinion. The slightly better value for money play is this card, the RX 7900 GRE from AMD. Now this takes the 7800 XT up a notch, keeping the same 16 gigs of VRAM, which is comfortable for 1440p gaming, and again, added another 7 or 8% performance, something which tips you into the high end of the 1440p bracket. Personally, this would be my go-to at this price.
price point, but I should also bring your attention to the RTX 4070 Super. This is Nvidia's super refresh of the original 4070, and again, brings you that little bit more performance. No extra VRAM with only 12 gigs, that puts it behind the 7900 GRE and 7800 XT, but again, even better ray tracing and DLSS performance. In a game like Cyberpunk, for example, where some of those Nvidia specific features are more beneficial, you'll actually see this outperform the 7900 GRE and even 7800 XT with all of those settings enabled, even though the card has on paper less power and less memory. Now then, what if you've got a little bit more money to spend still? Well, I'm afraid that we kind of have to jump up about $200 to reach our next price bracket with the RTX 4070 Ti Super and RX 7900 XT. Now these cards are in the region of seven to eight hundred dollars and are both really strong contenders. Again, the story with these two cards is pretty similar as the rest of the lineup. If you want more VRAM, you want better rasterization performance, then I would go for the 7900 XT. If you want a better all-round feature set and now with 16 gigs of VRAM, the original non-Super 70 Ti had a paltry 12, I would go for the 70 Ti Super. Now, I don't want to be seen as sitting on the fence here and as not wanting to give any definitive buying advice. If it was me and it was my money, I would go for the 70 Ti Super, plain and simple. However, I have to acknowledge the 7900 XT for many people will be a better buy. I think the extra money for the extra features is worth it. This is not sponsored by Nvidia, far from it. And I don't want to be seen as siding with Team Green because I'm not. But if you look at the user buyer data and the things that you guys are actually purchasing and the Nvidia versus AMD market share, I think a lot of you feel the same. Plain and simple, someone spending seven or eight hundred dollars on a GPU is happy to spend a bit more if it means they don't miss out on features that they may never use but may want to leverage one day without feeling a bit of buyer's remorse. Now that pushes us right up into the top end price brackets. We've gone through the two, three, four and five hundred dollar marks and we're now at the top end GPUs with three cards left in the lineup. Now the first of those is the 7900 XTX and this is easily in my opinion the best GPU for under $900. Why? Because there are none others under $900 apart from all of these. In all seriousness though the 7900 XTX is actually a really interesting card. When it launched I think we all thought it was going to rival the 4090 and spoiler alert it didn't. I mean I'd even go as far to say that it doesn't actually rival the 4080 Super either based on the fact that's most of the time a more powerful GPU and has a lot better things like ray tracing and DLSS. However the 7900 XTX basically provides as much rasterization performance as you can ever want, and AMD's own ray tracing tech is getting better. Now, if you want a top end GPU without necessarily paying the top end price tag, not that $900 isn't a lot of money, this is the GPU I'd pick. If you've got $1,000 to spend, you may deem the extra 100 or so worth it for the 4080 Super. Again, rasterization on these cards is very similar. The Super refresh has helped Nvidia in this regard, and a price drop from $1,100 to $1,000 makes it a more competitive compelling option than it was before. But what about at the very top end of the market? Well, plain and simple, if you want the best performance money can buy, you have to buy the 4090. And if recent interviews with senior figures at AMD are anything to go by, it looks like they're not going to be challenging the 4090 or potential 5090 anytime soon, as AMD themselves say they're looking to focus on the mid-range volume segment of the market. Something that's actually good news for lots of you guys watching, but something that I only fear will cause AMD to lag even further behind when it comes to features like ray tracing and FSR on the basis that those are often pioneered on the top end cards first before trickling down to the other SKUs. What do you guys think of my recommendations today? Let me know down below. I'll leave links to everything for latest pricing and availability in the description too. Thanks for watching and as always we'll see you in the next one.